Coming up on Tech News Today, the latest on the hacker wars. IMF, U.S. Senate, and more get hacked. Also, is Facebook falling? We'll look at the numbers. And U.S. is funding a secret internet. It's in a briefcase. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, June 13th, 2011. Tech News Today is brought to you by Slingbox, which just turned your iPad into a television. Slingbox introduces their new iPad app, so now you can watch your home TV on your iPad anywhere you take it. Check it out at Best Buy or slingbox.com slash twin. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Darren Kitchen. I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we kick around the Tech News of the Day, try to make some sense of it all. Boy, I'm glad you're here, Darren. Yes, I'm glad to be here, We're too. It's been the, two weeks. Without. We are full of the hacking today. Oh, is, is the hacking still going on? I believe so. They didn't get bored of the, the no, hacking? No, they've only design. gotten stronger and smarter. Maybe they need some Game Boys. We might talk <laughs> about whether this is really a rise in hacking or if it's reporting. just a rise in reporting of hacking. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's actually start with something non-hacky related. Uh, Facebook seeing a big traffic drop. They just reached 687 million monthly actives by, uh, by the start of June. This is according to Inside Facebook's Gold Data Service, where they look at the ad reporting from Facebook and, and take Facebook's own numbers there and estimate the audience. Uh, but face, Inside Facebook points out some interesting facts. Overall growth has been lower than normal for the second month straight. Uh, Facebook gained 11.8 million more people over May, following 13.9 million rise in April. However, in contrast, it grew at least 20 million new users over the typical month in the past 12 months. So 20 million, 20 million, 20 million to 13.9 mm -hmm. to 11.8. So they're, they're seeing a drop off here and they attribute it to the United States, uh, the UK and Canada. U U.S. lost nearly 6 million users and Canada dropped 1.52 million users. Well, you know what, I think, I don't know for a fact um, what's going on here, but it would make sense to me that the countries, because this is by country, that are the earliest adopters will kind of get to a plateau point. And then there are going to be some months that for whatever reason, a lot of people close accounts and you're going to see a little bit of a dip in emerging countries where people are just getting online or they're just getting Facebook accounts and it's still on the rise. That's where you're going to see your biggest growth on something as big as Facebook at this stage in the game. Now, Inside Facebook posted these numbers over the weekend after they did and it got picked up by, you know, every blog under creation. They posted a second clarification post saying, look, these are just based on the numbers we get out of this this ad tool. They are, they are not the be-all, end-all of Facebook's numbers. You have to look at them as trends. And they said and you have to compare them to other numbers sources like Comscore, like Compete, like Google Ad Planner, Quantcast, all of these which also have numbers of Facebook users reported. If you see the same trend in all of these different places, then you can start to say we've got a decline. Right now, it just looks like there might be a decline. They, they have a, a nice long post comparing all the known numbers so far from all these sources, but not all these sources have their May and June numbers out yet. So it's going to take a while for that to happen. Uh, basically, Inside Facebook says, we're going to be watching this closely. Bugs in the advertising tool that we draw this information from, seasonal changes like college graduations, other short-term factors can influence the numbers month to month and obscure what's really happening. So we need a few months before we can say for certain, but this is the first time they feel like you know what, we've seen a couple months now, so there may be something to this. Especially, I mean, if you look at the U.S., a drop of 6 million users, yeah, that's a small portion of the total number of U.S. users on Facebook, but 6 million people is a lot of people, or yeah, a lot of accounts anyway. you got to think about what that's going to do to our national virtual agriculture as well. There's a lot of farms that probably aren't being dealt <laughs> right. with. Those poor cows. Who will feed the farms? It, uh, inside Facebook does say, you know, comparing all of these different numbers, it looks like Canada... The United Kingdom and some early adopting countries have alternately shown gains and losses starting in 2010. Up until then, growth had generally been steadily up. Uh, they say there's an odd mix of data in the U.S. Most third parties showed Facebook with fewer monthly active users in January and February, but Facebook's own data didn't reflect that. Meanwhile, for May, the only third party to report numbers so far is showing growth in contradiction to what inside Facebook's is seeing from Facebook's own data. 
So it sounds like new data that, yeah, again, give it a few more months and then we'll see a trend. And meanwhile, in China, all the users of Ren Ren say, who cares? Yeah. Well, <laughs> and if, and that, you know, a lot of the folks were saying, look, if Facebook's starting to decline or, or even just stabilize in larger countries, if they want to hit their uh, one billion user mark, which is what they're after, mm -hmm. they're going to have to add China. And that that would change a lot of things, as Google well knows. I mean, how 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 many people in India are on Facebook, for example? You know, it's you India and China have got a lot of people in both countries. It's like they could probably get to a billion if if uh, a lot of people in India get online and get Facebook accounts. Facebook. I don't think they need China to get to a billion. Um, it would be helpful. They would get there quickly. Right. Uh, um, face, Facebook did respond to this and say, from time to time, we see stories about Facebook losing users in some regions. Some of these reports use data extracted from our advertising tool, which provides broad estimates on the reach of Facebook ads and isn't designed to be a source for tracking the overall growth of Facebook. We are very pleased with our growth. Except they said it in a Gladys voice. <laughs> yes, we are very pleased with our... I can't do <laughs> yeah, you can, I can't either. Now, what I find interesting, just looking at the graphic over at All Things D, is uh, it, it looks like there's... And I could just be that interpreting like the graph Brian. wrong. <laughs> yeah, is that, you know, it looks like... While Facebook is far and away larger than, you know, your Twitter, Tumblr, LinkedIn's of the world, they seem to be in a ever so slight increase. Now, is that, is that, do you think it would be something like where if you were just tired of Facebook, you would just leave and go to Twitter or something like that? Or if you were tired of Facebook, where would you go? I think you'd just stop using yeah. Facebook. I think if you're tired of Facebook, there's not... Twitter isn't the right alternative because they're just two different things. It's a lot lower impact. I, mean, I think you're just 100. tired of life. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. I see what it is. I'm sick of my hometown. I'm never talking to them on the internet again. Shaking the dust from these shoes, deleting my Facebook account, and hitting the road. Well, it, stranger things have happened. People do do that. Um, but no, I don't think that people are leaving Facebook to, to go to Twitter. They're on both or they decide to use one rather than the other. Um, also, a big story today, getting a lot of attention. Ars Technica has a very comprehensive article going into depth into the history of Microsoft's relationship with its developers, which is essentially Microsoft jerking around its developers and changing its platform all the time. Uh, but the, this the, one's going to be great. This one's, It's going to be on the cloud. The crux of this is Microsoft, of course, showed off Windows 8 last week, both at Computex and at D9, uh, and said, if you want to develop for this flashy new front end, uh, th then you're going to have to develop in HTML5 and JavaScript if you want those immersive apps that go full screen and stay in that experience. You're going to have to use HTML5 and JavaScript. And we all trumpeted that, like, finally, Microsoft getting on board with the standard. Well, the developers said, look, we've got decades of experience in .NET, in Windows uh, Platform, in, in Silverlight, and now you want us to just throw away all of that. They threw after away... They, they threw, threw away, away VB6. Visual Basic. Yeah. And, and at least, but at least you left us some things we were good at. Now you want to toss it all out and make us do a scripting language? None of us have done scripting languages before. Yeah, but think of all the, the people who do scripting languages that would love to fill, you know, that, that niche of, hey, you know, we, we want some wonderful weather widgets or whatever it is that you put on that whole new I, front and end. I, I, I think that's probably what's going to happen is Microsoft is going to come out with Windows 8 and say, look, underneath the splashy, fronty thing, is all of Windows. So you're going to continue to develop in .NET. You're going to continue to develop in, in all of the things that you've been developing for. Uh, it's just that you're not going to get that immersive experience, but you don't want that. That's you for the so? tablets. That's not for the enterprise. The <laughs> enterprise is going to continue to use this stuff. The weird thing is that Microsoft has not said that. They haven't even hinted at that. They haven't said anything about this. Right, because making an operating system that will only run HTML5 and JavaScript would just be blasphemy. Oh, wait, Chrome? Dang it. <laughs> well, yeah, but you're, you're building a whole new uh, uh, world of developers there. I, well, I think it's a painful transition for Microsoft. They, they're like, look, we're going to stop the mistake of making up our own platform for everything, like Silverlight, and we're going to move to a standard that everybody can use. And so when, a, when an app is made for, for Microsoft, it gets used everywhere. We're going to buy into this idea that the rising tide floats all boats, but that's going to be painful for people for a while. I got two thoughts on it. Basically, like, I, I see this as by the time this maybe gets to us, it might be something like just glorified gadgets like we're used to, like who uses, uh, but more to the forefront where other... Uh, Developers that are already making stuff for, say, the Chrome Web App Store and, and for other smartphones that have, you know, fantastic uh, HTML5 rendering and JavaScript uh, rendering engines is a great way to transition to that. It's nice to see Microsoft actually embracing some open standards yeah. for once. And uh, I think only good can come of it because if some whiz-bang awesome 
weather app or something makes it into Windows 8, well, then, hey, right-click view source. Let's get that on whatever other platform. And we are not going to see Microsoft kick out all the developers. I just don't, don't believe that. Build is their developer conference coming up in September. We'll find out more about what's really happening there. But the silence of Microsoft on this issue is deafening. You'd think if this was a misinterpretation, they'd be out there saying, hold on, everybody. You know, we're going to have lots of news coming at Build in September. So just, they don't have to say anything more than that. They don't have to promise anything. Mm -hmm. just, just say, look, you know what? Hang on, September, I think you'll be happy. But th they're not saying anything, which is like, yeah, you're not going to be happy. <laughs> well, I mean, at least we're still only talking about that skin on top, you know, and, and I see how that makes sense where, you know, you've got Windows 8 going to ARM, you've got, you know, the whole tablet thing, and, and I see a lot more integration with that and, you know, the Windows mobile side. Uh, it just makes sense that that would just, you know, restrict it to what you can do well on smaller platforms. Also today, a website is finally suing the United States government over domain name seizures. If you haven't been following this, the immigration uh, department, ICE, has been going around seizing domain names, using its powers as a, uh, you know, sort of defending the borders, saying if you are pointing to copyright infringing sites, it's illegal. You're crossing borders with your information, uh, and we're going to seize these domain names. But they're doing it without court orders. They're doing it out with, uh, without any uh, kind of oversight. And Puerto 80, a Spanish company, is now suing the Department of Homeland Security and ICE over a domain name seizure that occurred in January. They filed in the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. Puerto 80 runs Roja Directa Org, uh, which is not, uh, in the, they say unequivocally, not infringing copyrights uh, and therefore they should not have been taken down because and that Spanish in... courts have determined they're legal. Yeah, because the laws in Spain are different than the laws here and the courts have said so. Now, I wonder how Safe Harbor transitions over there because, I mean, the way that it is, these are forum sites and what ICE is upset about is that they're, you know, posting, uh, what is it, links to streaming sporting events that they don't have, you know, permission to. Mm -hmm. um, just like any other forum, you'd imagine that they are not responsible for what the users post. It's a pretty good defense as long as you don't ever start, you know, policing it actively, and then you do become responsible. Now, Ro Roja Directa has been fighting this uh, since February 3rd, when it sent ICE and the Department of Justice a letter requesting immediate return of the domain name. Uh, they've been negotiating before they went to, co to court. Uh, the, the best they got from the U.S. Attorney's Office was, as long as you never... Uh, link to anything in the United States, uh, you can you can you can have your domain name back. And they said no, they, it's illegal for us to link to things in the United States. That would be agreeing that we can't do things that are illegal. We're not going to agree with that. So instead, uh, they've decided to challenge the seizure in court. And this is why we have wonderful things like Open DNS. Darren, it's interesting the point that you made that once they start policing. I mean, if, let's say that there was a link that shouldn't be there. You'd think, okay, well, I guess uh, Roja Directa could just take down that particular posting. But once they do that, then they have to well, police everybody and rather than say, we, right. we were hands off completely. Correct me if I'm wrong here, Tom, but the way that, uh, uh, you know, my understanding is about safe harbor law, especially when it comes to forums, you know, since I administrate one, it's like if we get a DMCA takedown notice that says, hey, you know, this guy posted a forum thread that has links to these torrents of these movies. It's obvious copyright infringement. You know, um, please take it down, yada, yada, yada. Uh, it's nice because, you know, those DMCA takedown notices are like kind of like a shot above the bow and you're like, oh, okay, my bad. You remove it. Well, it's not even your bad. Well, it's it's not even the your idea bad. is you get a takedown notice as, as, a, as a safe harbor. You, as long as you make a significant effort to comply with all mm -hmm. of those takedown notices and respect the rights of users to challenge them and say, hey, wait a minute, that's, that shouldn't be taken down, then you, you're not being involved. You just have to be not encouraging it. Yes. Uh, you have to be responding, uh, and you have to be not taking an editorial hand in your forums. Now, I don't know that linking is illegal. I, well, I know it's that been, it's I, been tried a couple of times. I mean, even in the, uh, what is it, the, the original, the, the first big DMCA one, which was DCSS, uh, over a decade ago for uh, the, um, was it the DVD copyright stuff? And then they said just linking to that. Now, you as a, to, to defend your safe harbor status, if someone says that link 
uh, is illegal, you don't get to evaluate that. You have to assume they're right. That's one of the problems with the DMCA. Right. So well, maybe you that's can dispute why it though. That's why the the user can dispute it, not the safe harbor. Oh, really? Safe harbor just has to sit there and go. I don't think otherwise. Otherwise, you're losing. You're giving up your safe harbor. Mm -hmm. You're giving up your objectivity. I think. Uh, so, uh, you know, and Roja Directa may, may be saying, may not be saying that, but this isn't even hosting. This is just linking. And it's not illegal to link to things, especially if you don't really know. I mean, if I link to something on, on Hulu and then it turns out Hulu didn't have the rights to it, am, am I violating no, the law? I don't believe so. No. Yeah. yeah so, anyway, it's, it, it's, uh, it's something that I think I, I'm surprised didn't happen before now, but probably because of the, the time it takes to actually negotiate with the U.S. Attorney's Office is why we took it took six months, but we'll follow this case very closely. Let's take a uh, quick break and thank Slingbox. They turned your television into an iPad. Turned my, tele my iPad into a television. They didn't turn your television into an iPad. <laughs> that, that was their cool. next wow. project. 60-inch iPad. They're, they're gonna, working on they're gonna do, They're working on that. Right yeah. now, though, it's pretty awesome as well. Uh, turning your iPad into a television. I was doing this this weekend. Uh, I was able to, uh, I was visiting my father-in-law down in San Jose because I'm going to be out of town for Father's Day, so we're there a little earlier. I was able to pull up. Doctor Who, uh, Formula One racing, all this stuff that he doesn't get on his television from my iPad while sitting in his house, and I didn't miss a beat. I was even watching stuff on my way home on, on Slingbox. I was just, you know, like on the 3G, watching the race, keeping up with it. It's like having an extra television. We actually just put an iPad in our kitchen simply because... We want to have a television in there, and we use Slingbox to mirror what's in the other room so we can see some television in the kitchen as well. That must be fun, echoey goodness. Uh, yeah. Well, it, it, I mean, there's going to be a delay no matter what. There's, there's, they're far enough away that it shouldn't be a problem. That's cool. Uh, but, yeah, and, and plus we can put that in the spare room. Now we've got an extra television anywhere we it's want. It's better than yeah, getting a TV. The point is not to, like, have it close enough so that there would be an echo. Yeah. <laughs> no, you don't keep it in the same room. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I love the idea that, you you know, why even bother getting a second TV? You've already got Slingbox. An right. iPad is a better thing to have in the kitchen anyway. Just, you know, look up recipes and watch some mess. Plug it into the Internet. Plug it into your television. You got your television anywhere you want to go. Find it at Best Buy. Check it out at slingbox.com slash twit. Slingbox and your home TV now appearing on iPads everywhere. Ah, uh, the foreign governments allegedly behind cyber attack on IMF starts our Hacker Wars coverage today. Uh, the International Hacker Monetary Wars. Fund not talking, uh, but according to sources talking to Bloomberg and researchers talking to BBC, uh, the attack on the IMF has all the hallmarks of a nation-state-sponsored attack. Sources told the New York Times the attack lasted several months. IMF board members were reportedly briefed on the attack Wednesday, but there was no public announcement of the attack. Staff were told that suspicious file transfers were detected two weeks ago and that these were linked to a compromised desktop computer within the IMF, likely due to spear phishing of some sort. They were also reassured that there was no evidence that personal data was taken or that they would be victims of of fraud. However, as a precautionary measure, the World Bank shut down its direct network connection to the IMF. Well, this is kind of the norm, isn't it? Hey, we don't think anything was taken, but let's just go ahead and unplug because we don't know what's going to happen. What about next this week link so? of the advanced persistent threat, which is code name for a foreign really nation? Really big hack, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I could see how there might be, you know, a, a definitely a foreign government um, motivation, say, uh, but uh, that's not to say that, there, that, you know, there couldn't be a motivation from, from any um, mm -hmm. private individuals either. Uh, at first when I saw this, it was just like, oh, great, you know, everybody's, you know, in, um, in hacker red alert mode recently, and uh, I could imagine how somebody could run across some, you know, just spyware or machine or anything like that, because this, this phishing stuff is uh, it's like everywhere, right? But what they're calling it is a, uh, you know, they're using the advanced persistent threat thing, the, the major breach. Oh, our security is so tough, so it must have been, you know. What uh, foreign nation would want to attack the IMF? I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of foreign nations that would, but what foreign nation would want to attack the IMF and have the capability to do that? It, it likely. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I see. Yeah. The, the profile and the motivation combining here. But well, maybe, I'm, probably just, maybe not, I'm just not, I'm also not, I'm not comfortable well enough versed on the pointing whole... Pointing my finger at a nation. Yeah. 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 So probably not Belgium or Sweden or France or the Netherlands or Germany or the United States or Spain. Why do you say that? Well, it's just because they're managing directors. Well, yeah. Or maybe it's an inside job. Right. Ah. Oh. Ah. Oh. 
Yeah. <laughs> they, well, they definitely have made. Brazil's you know, got some skills. They've down made their there. fair share of. Uh, Brazil's got skills. Enemies. But they don't really need to hack the eye. They've got quite a bit of. Uh, criti- uh, you know, they've been criticized plenty of times for their impact on public health, their impact on food. I mean, even Bill yeah. Clinton has gone um, and and kind of. Um, it could be based over over things. food shortages. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, I could. See, that's that the could reason be. why I'm just like I understand the whole advanced persistent threat is the you know easy out here it's like the oh new black. since we're, yeah it's the new black because it's just like we're so cool it must have been you know a country with hundreds of hackers and infinite resources you know I you, well you know if we can't decide because if we, if we can't decide or we don't know what country is responsible yeah blame Canada right. oh I think that's there's that, even that a is, song yeah, that, that that's is the a policy. rule so yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Okay. it's just the easiest thing. Other they hack- are a member, though. Other hacker war. Well, almost all countries are ha- are members. So. They just want it to yeah. seem like they wouldn't do something because they're a member and mm-hmm. they're polite. Right. Not so. We're on to you, Canada. Other hacker wars events over the weekend. Uh, the anonymous group took credit for bringing down the Spanish National Police Force website for about an hour as part of Op Policia. Spanish police will not admit that an attack brought down their website. They admit the website went down. They're like, websites go down for all kinds of reasons. <laughs> uh, on Friday, Turkey's state-run news agency reported that police detained 32 individuals allegedly linked to Anonymous. So expect more operations to target Turkey now. Uh, and Anonymous indicated today it will target the Federal Reserve next on Flag Day, June 14th, uh, because uh, they want Ben Bernanke to step down. They disagree with this policy. Why do they tell us when exactly they plan to hack something specific? Well, part of what it is to, of to get more people to join them in the in the uh-huh. attack, I suppose. Right, but right. it also, it's a little bit like calling your shot. Like, we're after you, and look... We we got you. Yeah, do something before the 14th. We even warned you, and you still couldn't stop us. Yeah. Expect us. Right. All of that stuff. Uh, LulzSec, the other group that's out there uh, taking uh, responsibility for hacks, hacked into Bethesda Games uh, and then said they might not release usernames because they love Call of Cthulhu. Uh, they demanded more info on Skyrim, one of Bethesda's games. And then I don't brief, blame briefly them. on... It looks hot. <laughs> it does look hot. <laughs> briefly on Twitter, they asked for a LulzSec top hat to be added to Skyrim, but then that Twitter disappeared. So I'd I don't know if they changed their minds. Egg. But demanding hats. Yeah. I, gotta, I gotta give a tip of the hat. For that. Sarah could give a tip of the hat. Well, remember the company... Uh, who was the company that LulzSec uses uh, uh, to keep their website up that they... Gave accolades to Cloudflare. Cloudflare. Remember, they were like, "We love Cloudflare. Can we get a premium account?" <laughs> <laughs> so they're not. Like, they're not afraid to ask. Right. Uh, the Lulsec also has hacked the U.S. Senate uh, because they say they don't like the U.S. government or its boats. I see. Anyway, Lulsec pretty. They're, they're big on boats over there. Their rhetoric is hilarious. They get a tip of hat for the re- rhetoric, maybe a wag of the finger for the methods. Because mm-hmm. sometimes they release people who they had nothing to do with it. Like, you know, the, yeah. like the, what is it, 26,000 porn site, uh, or porn.com yes. usernames and passwords. Right, 26,000 uh, porn usernames were, were hacked, and now they've released them and said, go to these people's Facebook yeah, accounts. Yeah, and then Facebook had to go and disable those people's accounts because they're like, oh, wait, no, we should probably protect our users. That gets a wag of the finger. Yeah, and so does the, uh, what was it, 160-some-odd uh, uh, webmaster at otherpornsite.com that had membership there, so... I guess you got to look in on the competition. Oh, and or just be proud of what you do in your spare time. There man. you go. Who cares? Yeah. This is me. Yeah. And uh, finally, Taiwanese PC maker Acer says they're investigating uh, the hacker attack that stole customer data from its Packard Bell unit in Europe uh, around a month ago. Uh, Pakistan's cyber army claimed to have stolen the data of about 40,000 people. Uh, this hack has done uh, has mostly had the effect of reminding people that Packard Bell still exists. <laughs> yeah. Zing. I said the same thing. <laughs> All right, a couple more stories before we get to news fuse. Uh, New York Times has a really in depth report today about the U.S. State Department backing several projects to create stealth cell nets and internet services, uh, one of which is an internet in a su- suitcase. State Department has given a $2 million grant for a group to develop. A, a suitcase internet based on mesh networking. Suitcase would include a small wireless antenna, which would increase the area of coverage, a laptop to administra- administer the system, thumb drives and CDs to spread the software to other devices and encrypt communications, and then other stuff like Ethernet cables and, and things like that. But uh, the idea is that you spread these around in you know a country like Egypt, uh, when Egypt had shut down the internet or when mm-hmm. Syria shut down the internet, and then the internet comes back up. And right. you can talk to each other. Yeah, this is good and important stuff. Uh, it's 
can be cool to see you know this deployed mesh networking if you're not familiar with it is a really cool technology where I could just put an access point that access point doesn't necessarily have to have its own connection to the internet but as long as it's within range of one of its sibling access points and even that sibling access point doesn't have to have its own direct internet connection as long as it can see another one and they well, tell two friends and they some actual access and, and then though. eventually there is one yeah but as long as there's a route back to the original one you can you and know, the route can an be area. as long as it needs to be well i mean within you know as long as they can get a signal to each other and in wi-fi in some cases you can get several miles wow so there's also a lot of uh, a lot of stories in here about creating uh, stealth wireless networks to be used in places like libya where the uh, the cell phone network is is vulnerable to uh, tapping by the op opposition government. Uh, there's a story about using Bluetooth as sort of a mesh network in Iran, where people send files to each other and they're trying to expand uh, the the application that they're using, so that you send a file to somebody over Bluetooth and then it would just go to trusted sources automatically and and have like a Bluetooth mesh network. Yeah, one thing yeah. is for sure that you know uh, private citizens needs to have their own access to inter uh, to you know internet or other you know networking resources that aren't at the um, you know under the thumb of the government. So I applaud this and uh, and everybody else who has set up like who is it wasn't it Seattle that was one of the first to set up you know mesh, mesh networks, networks yeah. of this sort it's great stuff the other thing this is great for is if ISPs continue to put in bandwidth caps and uh, re and drag their feet on rolling out high bandwidth uh, this is the kind of U.S. government-funded research that created the internet in the first place mm -hmm. there might rise one day a mesh network alternative that would just make ISPs unnecessary yeah it'd be it would just drive them out of business everything could be a mesh network eventually and you're just connecting to the to the air we have the technology it's absolutely not like, yeah it's just a matter of and if everybody and if nice. the need is is pushed by greedy isps and funded by the u.s government because they want to use it against their enemies mm -hmm. which is exactly why we created the internet right we wanted we wanted to defend our communication system against our enemies that is the thing that could actually keep the internet free in a weird, torturous kind of way. It sounds to me like it would be a lot more complicated than that, though. Not hey, really. I mean, building your own internet, this. especially with IP6, we could totally That's exactly what happened. The, 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 the internet is exactly that same yeah. thing. Politically, I'm saying. Politically, it would be more complicated than just saying, U.S. government created the infrastructure. Why do we need ISP? But there's no well, infrastructure. It's, it's, That's it's the beauty bit, of mesh. I, well, you get into some... Creative I mean, capability. Putting my engineer hat on, you're right. You do get into some technical limitations where, okay, so the, the FCC gives us 2.4 gigahertz to have fun with. Uh, and that's how we're able to have fun with Wi-Fi without having to get a license or anything like that. But with that comes those technical limitations where, okay, sure, we're going to build our own Internet. Well, who's got the fiber to connect the East Coast to the West Coast and, and whatnot? So, yes, I see that. Uh, although there have been several great community projects, like I mentioned, in Seattle. I know Detroit has one as well. Um, well the Internet was built by the government and got handed over to the and, people. And people. People are allowed to use it. So there's yeah. precedent for it. That's we we could build, The people could build one and give it to the government and then keep them off so that the DDoS attacks wouldn't affect our routers. There you go. Yeah. Think about that. But mesh networks might be a little more resistant to DDoS as well. I don't know. You can take down a Wi-Fi access point pretty easily. You can take a Wi-Fi access point, but mesh networks ha inherently have good ways to route around all kinds of things, and you have a lot more routes that True. you can I, take. I, you know, I inherently just think uh, Wi-Fi when we talk yeah, about no. mesh networking, but uh, you're right, any other medium. I mean, in Egypt, they were using dial-up. And there's always, there's always a way to take down anything, too. That's, that's the other side of it. Uh, finally, a study by Stella Service, which used a network of full-time mystery shoppers, I wanted to be a mystery shopper. I would I love kid. to, yeah. Uh, they used a full-time network of mystery shoppers to evaluate each website uh, to uh, rate internet retailers' customer response times, making more than 1,200 interactions via phone and email. And here are the winners. SierraTradingPost.com ranked first when it came to the shortest average amount of time the customers had to wait on hold. Six seconds. Wow. Office Depot, best at getting back to emails, 48 minutes. Oh, yeah, so don't email if you want a fast response. Only one company made it into the top 10 for both speediest email and phone support. That was DisneyStore.com. 12 seconds to answer the phone. Uh, an hour and 47 minutes for email support but made the say, top 10. As far as the email responses, under an hour, uh, considering that sometimes it'll take 24 to 48 hours, I know my bank will give me that window, under an hour for a response time from Office Depot is not bad. Mm -hmm. If you're going through the email, I mean, you're not trying to get somebody on the phone, that's not terrible. Does anybody remember when you used to 
press zero, and then a few seconds later, there was somebody that said, hello. No. Now now you just keep pressing what? zero. Keep pressing that. zero, <laughs> and half the time they say, I'm oh, sorry, you mean, that you command was not you understood. Pick up, right. Yeah, you'd pick up the phone. Yeah, you'd, you'd, you'd pick up the phone, you hear dial tone, you press one oh, digit, yeah, yeah, you, got, yeah. you got somebody You got else. an operator, but you didn't get a customer service report. I, I can I can uh, never no, remember but I'm just calling saying, a like, company the, and having that but, happen. Well, that was a company. That was the phone company. They picked up really quick. Yeah. Now you sound like I is. Okay. <laughs> Ouch. Being a mystery shopper would rock. Do you ever have exceptionally good customer service and you think to yourself, this is like an in-person. Every once in a while, someone will be so nice to me that I'm like, I think they think I'm a food critic or something <laughs> because it's too good. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Being a mystery shopper, like going to restaurants might be awesome. Being this kind of mystery shopper, the uh -huh. kind that's waiting for, like, this is the yeah. stuff that I hate is right. waiting on right. hold or waiting for contact. Yeah. To get Imagine like Would the bottom like. of the barrel. So they took five hours yeah, exactly. to take me off hold. Was that fun? Yeah. No. yeah I think I just got Not that fun. actually. Yeah. yeah. By the way, uh, worst <laughs> hold times for calling. Again, these are all internet retailers. Uh, Barnesandnoble.com, eight minutes, three seconds. Gets the gets the title for worst uh, in that study found uh, the the worst email response time crateandbarrel.com eighty eight hours. Ooh. This is the average to get I, back to you. I yeah. Other eighty eight. Well, my average. question is, you know, I, I was reading how like oh the auto parts guys they're really quick to email you back, but uh, but I guess the question begs like, all right, what was the response? You know, was it anything useful? You know, yeah. maybe Crate and Barrel takes 88 hours because they're like, you know, checking solving, swatches. They're solving world peace. Yeah. 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 Or scanning They rearranged swatches. your new living room for you. <laughs> for you. All you have to do is say yes. And gonna, you don't have to yeah. talk to anybody. You <laughs> press one. Yeah. Do you want a new living room? Yeah. Yeah. And then, then the parts guys, they just reply with uh, make and model. Yeah. Yeah. Was that a four banger? Or We're going to need about 88 hours to construct your new couch. I'm guessing that the cell phone carriers were not involved in this study or those yeah. uh, phone times mm. would be much longer. Yeah. On now to the news views. Loadsys just pinged in their ping pong game with alleged patent violators. Uh, if you remember when Apple sent a letter advising them not to sue iOS developers, Loadsys said fine and sued seven developers. Last week, we reported that 4C had filed for declaratory judgment in that case, hoping to kill the suit before it started. Loadsys has now responded saying fine and filed 10 lawsuits against 4C clients. Loadsys is so passive aggressive, man. LightSquared's wireless network may mess with GPS signals. That's at least according to tests by the National Executive Committee for Space-Based Positioning, Navigation, and Timing. The committee's uh, tests show aircraft navigation systems would be jammed by LightSquared transmitters. A LightSquared VP says the company can co come up with a may way pardon me, to mitigate interference so company can continue with plans to roll out its network. I hope so. The value of the anonymous, oh, I'm sorry, uh, difficult to trace online currency, Bitcoin, <laughs> took a hit last week. The currency's valuation fluctuates just like any other currency, but on Friday it lost over 30% of its value. You can actually see how Bitcoin is doing uh, over at the largest Bitcoin exchange, which is MountGox.com, M-T-G-O-X. If you're in the U.S. and have been dying to buy an iPhone that isn't locked to a carrier, you might get your wish this Wednesday. According to a tweet by an iPhone developer, Apple will start selling unlocked iPhone 4s this Wednesday. That would mean you'd be able to try out other carriers, swap out SIM cards to your heart's content, and when you travel, you'd be able to just get a SIM card from any carrier out there and pop it in your iPhone. No worries about data roaming. Hope this is true. Cloud-based music services are all the rage, but they're in their infancy and none have exactly emerged as a winner, at least not yet. According to Billboard.bz, HP is now in serious talks with music labels to put together a cloud music service that would work on HP products. Would that get people interested in the HP ecosystem? No. Or at least more than they are now? Probably not. No. What if it does? Maybe. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Cla cloud. Music. Music cloud. Wait, you said cloud? It's going to work. Yeah. Shake a tree. Anyway. Uh, Barnes & Noble's <laughs> newest nook, the Simple Touch Reader, has a big surprise up its sleeve. Bluetooth. Once again, Barnes & Noble doesn't list Bluetooth as a feature on the nook, but it's there. So that's two secret features that we've got coming out. Uh, uh, you know, at home, uh, a browser. Now, Bluetooth, what's, what's next? Shh, shh, they're secrets. ADW I'm launcher? To tell. Yeah. Cash. Ooh. Cash money. <laughs> $1 million <laughs> bills secret found inside button. Barnes & Noble. <laughs>
Uh, Google booted a bunch of apps from its Android market, including apps that posed as Angry Birds cheat. Some of the apps used malware called Plankton, which uploads all sorts of fun information like your IMEI number, web history, say your bookmarks. Uh, so if you were trying to cheat Angry Birds a while ago, you may have trouble on your hands. Just They're saying. angry. Yeah. You don't mess with them. You're going to be angry. Back at WWDC, Steve Jobs talked all about MobileMe's transition to iCloud, but there wasn't really any mention of the iWeb site hosting service. A lot of people still use that. A MobileMe user decided to email Steve to find out if he needed to find an alternative host, and Jobs decided to reply, and it was a really nice, long-worded uh, paragraphs um, that really uh, spelled it out in great detail. Uh, the email read, yep. That's That's... Long for Steve, actually. Yeah. Sometimes he just yep. uses one character and you yep. have to divine. I mean, it's, Might it's, have just said Y. Yeah. Yeah. Like w, yep. the, the letter Y. Right. Yeah. W, w H Y. That'd be way too much. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> or A or R. So, yes, anyone who's, uh, who's, who's using the iWeb the site hosting service still, I, I'm sure some of you are out there, uh, you will need to find another alternative. Steve Jobs said so himself. Yep. 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 There you go. Time for the randomizer. Randomizer. Ah, yes, the cable business. They have all these billions of miles of cable laid in the ground across the country. And yet, the fiber optic business is saying, your cables are dead. Your cables are useless. We will crush you. <laughs> it's also really expensive to roll out that fiber optic cable. So, cable equipment provider Aris uh, will demonstrate on Monday it can deliver speeds of up to 4.5 gigabits per second by upgrading the existing cable broadband networks. That's that's quite a jump up from the Doxus 3 spec of 200 megabits per second. Yeah, I mean, top top speed you can usually get is 50 to 100 megabits per second mm -hmm. right now. This is 4.5 Gigabits Actually, per second. Actually, Comcast here offers 101 megabits per second, yet the Ethernet port on the back of the modem is only uh, a 100 megabit connection. So that extra one megabit you could theoretically never have, even with jumbo frames. Anyway, this is just a demonstration right now. It's not something they're going to roll out. The beautiful thing about this. they'll roll out because the mesh network's coming. I, I love the beautiful thing about this. The, the irony is that the, the cable networks, they actually have a ton of bandwidth. It's all just being used by television. So what is this new demonstration? It's, oh, drop a few TV channels. You can free up more bandwidth. That's not what the demonstration is. Oh, come on. <laughs> no. That's the way I read it. Is it? Yeah. That's, is it for real? That's exactly how I read it. Hey, you know what? If you just get rid of ESPN, you can push a lot of internet down there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, why not? All that stuff is just MPEG-4 streams anyway. That's true. I'm probably going to get an email to MPEG something. Uh, something. Now to the calendar. The Webby Awards is streaming tonight. If you want to watch it, you can go to Facebook.com slash The Webby Awards. Lisa Kudrow is hosting. Ooh. And there are a variety of performers ranging from Nora Jones to Antoine Dodson. You know, had your kids, had your wife. I'd love to see him Hodge, perform that. I certainly haven't seen that enough. I've actually no, watched it like 45 times. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, if you want to watch, please tune in tonight. Toshiba Thrive pre-orders now live starting at $430. Ending up in your hands mid-July. Mid-July. So about a, about a month later. The first commercial deployment of SPDY, that's a protocol designed by Google Spitty. to make websites faster. Spitty? I don't know. Speedy. 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 We agree well, on that makes much more sense once. than SPDY. <laughs> Speedy is launching today. It's going to make websites faster. Take that, G-Zip. It all makes sense now. I was like, SPDY, way to go, Google. Uh, AMD Fusion Developer Summit begins today, and this is actually interesting because it's their first developers conference in eight years. I wonder if Bill anyone AMD. remembered to join. To sign so up. To I, think they did. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think then, it's going to be well. Yeah, done. people are, are, are happy it's back. The IPv6 World Congress kicks off Spitty. in London tomorrow, June 14th. Last week's IPv6 day will be studied to inform the next steps an IPv6 rollout and we'll domination. Not be stopped, IPv6. I'll be hanging out at colon colon one. Just letting you know. Okay. Thank you. Duke Nukem Forever has launched, uh, is launching in the U.S. tomorrow, also June 14th. It's already shipping to some folks. Some folks are saying, yeah, yeah, it's a real thing. According to Metacritic, though, the game's not really doing well. It's scoring 68% on PCs, 60% no, on the 360. 58% on the PS3. Those are lackluster. That's what I would call those. Yeah. They I mean, lack if, luster. If you were in you check it out? a classroom, oh, those wouldn't be yeah. good grades. But yeah. 
It's a piece of internet history. And if it's a yeah. train wreck, that almost makes it better. Yeah. <laughs> it's so bad, it's good. Yeah. Type thing. yeah it might I mean, become a cult classic. Maybe. Mm. It already has. Yeah, I guess you're right. I, it's already a cult classic. With the dream of it. It was a cult classic before it was. I think it would have been better not it. to release right. it. I agree. Boxy users without a box on PC, Mac, or Ubuntu are getting a fall update, open source, and an open source release. So that's good news for Boxy users. And the Wii U will hit shelves with a bang, or maybe just with a whimper. Spring or summer 2012, says a Sega executive. That's, yeah, that's not official. That's just a Sega exec yeah. kind of leaking that. So on to the email. TNT at twit.tv is the place to go. Uh, we asked for pilots to write in. And give us their opinions on the uh, on the on the whole uh, cell phones on planes thing. Vic, the Texas Rancher pilot, comes through again. Uh, he says airlines are slow to adapt to new tech. iPad is great for manuals because pilots need reference materials like charts and manuals. iPad has lots of advantages like replacing the pilot's flight bag, which reduces fuel costs. So that's why you want to have the tablets. Uh, in 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 the cockpit with you. Much longer explanation of all of this uh, in his full email, which we'll have in our show notes at twit.tv slash TNT in the wiki. Uh, next email from Cake Wolf in Placerville, California. Hey, TNT crew. In Friday's Shady episode, you discussed Microsoft partnering with regional content providers for the U.S. for Xbox Live TV. I was all too excited when this was announced at E3, but upon hearing the name Comcast, my first thoughts went to their practice of data caps. Currently, my Comcast service has a monthly data usage allowance of 250 gigabytes, and per Comcast, you should know that the vast majority, around 99% of Comcast customers, use significantly less than 250 gigabytes per month. That's a, a quote from Comcast. Well, since last November, our family has been attempting to use more online video outlets, including Comcast, on Xfinity TV, and have significantly breached this level, averaging in the range of 320 to 350 gigabytes per month. Our family of six is larger than most, but with online watching of Twit, Hulu, Netflix, Xfinity, and other websites adds to online gameplay from a variety of smartphones, iPads, PCs, Xboxes, Wiis. The addition or migration of standard TV viewing would put any normal family easily over such caps. Um, goes on to say, one item in particular that caught my attention was the reference on a Twitch show that since the Xbox can stream in HD, Netflix shows would default to that format if available, increase the size of the download stream if Xbox Live TV service would also default to HD levels whenever possible. Could that push past any cap levels at an accelerated rate? Hmm. hmm. Well, and here's the problem with these with these bandwidth caps is, we think Comcast put this cap in to cover their ass so that if they right. do want to go after somebody who's using an abnormally large amount, that they can. And they've got lots of wiggle room to go after them because they got in trouble for, for, put, for throttling and cutting off access for torrenters who they felt were overusing when they had no actual limit. Right. And folks were like, look, you, there's no limit in my contract. Why are you cutting me off? Uh, so we think Comcast doesn't want to cut anyone off. They're not tracking every gigabyte you make in order to cut you off as soon as you get to 250. They're just, they just want this as sort of a speed limit. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't mean at any moment they couldn't change their mind or some new executive take over and say, going to enforce that 250 gigabyte limit. Going to need that uh, open mesh a lot. It sooner. would cost more to enforce the limit than I think they would make in, in freeing up bandwidth. Unless they put in a tiered charging system, which case, then if they decide to do that, I would, I would be more worried. Well, that's it for this edition of Tech News Today. Darren Kitch, thank you so much for being in on Mondays. It's good to be back. It's been two weeks. I know. We, we missed, missed you. you. I, I miss you guys. Don't ever go away. I will, I will never not leave again. this chair. Don't say that, Darren, okay. because when you do, I'm going to be disappointed. Okay. I promise. I'm just setting her up. Just, just come back on Mondays. That's all, all right. we want. Yeah. Okay. I'll do yeah. that. Don't overpromise. <laughs> What's going Under on? Promise, do, 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 and then you get to be the hero without yeah. doing a thing. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. Dude, you got to check out Hack Tip. We just launched this new show, H A K T I P. It's so cool. It's uh, have you ever wondered about uh, um, Mac Mac addresses? I will explain everything you ever didn't need to know about them in fine detail. It's it's a fun show where we're uh, kind of diving into a lot of fundamental stuff. So if you watch Hack Five and you're like, hey, what is are you putting the fun in fundamentals? I am okay. definitely, <laughs> and also making it practical as well. Excellent. Cool. Thanks, everybody, for watching. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. Call us. Leave us a good, solid 30-second or less voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW, or give us an email, tnt at twit.tv. We'll talk to you tomorrow.